I'm Ezra Levant. It's June 6th, and you're watching Battleground. Hello, and welcome to Battleground. Every day at 12 noon Eastern Time, 5 p.m. in the UK, we talk about the news, and you talk back to me in the form of chat. Those are the live comments you see streaming to the right of the screen. And Google's invented something called Super Chat, where if you keep in a few bucks or a few quid, as they say in Old Blighty, uh, your chat is highlighted in a bright color. It stands out. Uh, and it even is stuck there for a period of time. I read those, and I'm grateful for them because uh, YouTube actually passes that dough on to us to help cover our bills. Uh, it's fun just to have some grassroots interaction. For the last 10 days or so, we've been talking about a shocking case out of the United Kingdom that has global ramifications, namely our former report reporter Tommy Robinson being arrested and summarily sentenced to 13 months in prison for the high crime of reporting outside a rape gang trial. Uh, he was live streaming outside a courthouse in Leeds where 27 men and two women were on trial inside for abusing British girls as young as age 11 for years and years and years. And I watched that live stream by Tommy. He was very careful. He did not say that the accused were convicted. He called them accused. He did not step on court property. He did not reveal any confidences from inside the courthouse. He was outside the courthouse. Nonetheless, the judge saw him, sent seven officers to grab him, and within hours, Tommy was on his way to Her Majesty's prison, Hull, to serve 13 months of a sentence. He's been there for more than 10 days. Um, I have some more Tommy news for you today. Uh, the British singer Morrissey, formerly the uh, lead singer of the Smiths, has weighed in on Tommy, and this does not surprise me one bit. Morrissey is a fascinating character, uh, ultra hip, but occasionally um, says things that are truly counterculture. I mean, a lot of the hipsters in the world are easy leftists, conventional thinking. They're people who uh, go with the flow. They think it's edgy to say, I'm worried about global warming. They say it's edgy to say, you know, to go to an Occupy Wall Street rally or whatever the trendy cause of the day is. Not Morrissey. Uh, I want to read to you um, some comments that he made. He made them in a rather obscure publication in the UK called Tremor, I think it's called. And I read them on Tremor, but I think much more interesting is how that report in Tremor was taken by the mainstream media in the UK, especially by the tabloids, and torqued against Morrissey and, of course, against Tommy Robinson. I'm going to read that to you in a moment. I see there's a super chat there. Bennis Case has covered the 9th June march and then the Al-Quds march next day. See who gets preferential treatment. Isn't that, isn't that a great point? I, I want to read to you from The Sun. Can we put that up on the screen here? The Sun, of course, one of the leading tabloids in the UK. Their readers are culturally, I would put it to you, in sync with Tommy Robinson. But look at how disparaging they are of Morrissey, whose nickname is Moz or Maza. The version I have in my hand says Morrissey attacks shocking treatment of Tommy Robinson and loss of free speech in UK in latest bizarre interview. A slightly different headline is on the screen. Morrissey attacks shocking treatment. But, but look at that. Bizarre interview. Is it bizarre to talk about Tommy Robinson being sent to prison for 13 months? Is that bizarre? Or is the underlying fact bizarre? Is, is Morrissey bizarre for talking about it? The Sun newspaper is talking about it. Everyone in the UK is talking about it. People around the world are talking about it. Is it bizarre? Um, let me read some more. Put that back up on the screen, if you please. I just want to show people that I'm, that I'm, I'm going to read you what Morrissey said, but I'm going to read you how it was spun. And I think it's very interesting to look at the comparison. In a rant, do you see that? That's the deck, which is called the subheadline, the deck. In a rant about the loss of free speech, Morrissey defended the EDL founder and described his treatment as shocking. Is it a rant? A rant implies madness, unhingedness, distemperate, intemperate, off 
key off balance rant. How does the Sun know if it was a rant? The Sun didn't do the interview. This magazine Tremor or whatever did. I don't know if it was a live interview or by email. A rant. A rant about the loss of free speech. You'd think <laughs> the Sun <laughs> would have a real interest in defending free speech. Don't you think they're a tabloid? In fact, the Sun got into some trouble, didn't they? Uh, for their vigorous use of free speech. Um, the Sun loves free speech for the Sun. The Sun thinks it's a bizarre rant when you're defending free speech for Tommy Robinson. I bet if you took a poll of the Sun's readers, most of them support Tommy Robinson. Um, let's keep reading. Let's put that back up there. Former Smith's frontman Morrissey has defended Tommy Robinson and described his treatment as shocking. In another controversial interview, is it not shocking that a man is picked up on the streets by six offi seven officers and within hours is in prison? Is that not shocking? If that is not shocking to you, then you are numb. A controversial interview. Well, we certainly won't want anything controversial in the pages of The Sun. They're very pristine that way, aren't they? Let me read some more. In a rant about the loss of free speech, Morsi also reiterated his support for far-right political party for Britain, founded by anti-Islam activist Anne-Marie Waters. I'm, I'm pretty familiar with for Britain and, and with uh, Anne-Marie Waters. Um, not that it's relevant to her politics, but I suppose everything is these days. She's a, a lesbian activist feminist, but I guess because she doesn't like the rape of indigenous British girls at the hands of Pakistani Muslim rape gangs. That makes her far right. Do you, do you know who Anne-Marie Waters is? She, she ran, ran for the leadership of UKIP, didn't get it. She started her own party called For Britain. Um, can you really be far right if you're a feminist, leftist on social policies, lesbian, who just doesn't like girls being raped by is that is that far right or is that, is that the sun? Is that the sun demonizing people its own viewers support? Can, can you show more of that website? Just put it up there, please, and scroll down a little bit. The outspoken singer defended Tommy Robinson in his latest bizarre rant. Yeah, you've said bizarre and rant now several times. In a bizarre rant, you just can't stop saying that. Can't, in a bizarre rant, the singer also said, I don't think the word racist has any meaning anymore. Well, you know, what a profound man. I, I tell you this, Morris, he's a poet, he's a philosopher, and he's a keen observer. If <laughs> It's almost a, a rebuttal to what he knew the son would say. Because if you're calling <laughs> Anne-Marie Waters far right, you've pretty much beaten the living daylights out of that word so it doesn't mean anything anymore. He claimed the party has been dismissed by the mainstream media with the usual childish racist accusation, adding, I don't think the word racist has any meaning anymore. It's almost as if he knew what the son was going to say. But here's what really gets me. Robinson the founder of the English Defense League live-streamed himself for an hour on Facebook Live, identifying defendants in a live court case last month. Well, yes, Tommy was the founder of the English Defense League years ago, and Tommy left the English Defense League when he detected that it was becoming increasingly racially intolerant, and Tommy is no racist. Imagine abandoning an organization you founded. Uh, they don't mention that, that he quit it for that reason. They still hang it around his neck because they think it means they tag him as racist. Is the son not exactly proving what Morrissey said? And as you know, because you follow it more closely than the fools that the son do, uh, Tommy identified the defendants by name at a live court case last month, and so did the British Broadcasting Corporation and every other media in the UK. Tommy def identified the defendants by name by reading a web page of the BBC. The item goes on and on. I didn't do a proper count. I think the words bizarre and rant probably, I'm wearing a tie today, probably appear, I don't know, eight times in that article. Um, I think that article says as much about the sun as it does about Tommy or Morrissey, doesn't it? Actually, I learned about Morrissey that he's not afraid to say things, that he is politically incorrect and doesn't give a damn, and that he follows dissident political activists quite closely, Anne-Marie Waters, Tommy Robinson, and that he's a true contrarian, not these fake showbiz lovies, as they're called in the UK, who are very edgy by coming out against global warming before stepping into their private jet. Um, 
I'll admit I like Morrissey. I'm glad I did not d- discover Morrissey when I was a teenager. I don't think I could have handled the emo angst. But there's two songs that come to mind when I think of Tommy Robinson and working class Brits, especially the working class British girls as young as 11 who are systematically targeted for exploitation and extortion and rape by Muslim rape gangs. And more importantly, um, how the 5P professionals in the UK respond to them. The police, the politicians, the press, the prosecutors, and the professors. Uh, And you just saw a case of the press here, the, the Sun. Can I play for you, will you indulge me? Can I play for you two short clips from some Smith's songs. Actually, the, 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 the second one is from Morrissey himself. Um, the first one's an excerpt from, Morrissey, from the Smith's song called Lifeguard Sleeping, Girl Drowning. That was written decades ago, but would you not agree with me that the people who should be the lifeguards in the United Kingdom today are sleeping? and that hundreds of thousands of girls are drowning. Here, play the short clip. Please don't worry, there'll be no fuss. She was, nobody's nothing. I don't know if you heard that. Um, Please don't worry, there'll be no fuss. She was nobody's nothing. You know, she was just so irritating anyway. She was nobody's nothing. Don't worry about it. I'm, I'm, whenever I think of Chelsea Wright, the uh, young mum from Sunderland, who went to a bar, and next thing she knew, she woke up in a house with five migrants from Syria and Iraq and two different DNA samples in her. Um, and, the, and the police didn't care, and the prosecutors didn't care, and the press didn't care, and the professors didn't care, and the... Politicians didn't care, and uh, she was nobody's nothing. I mean, she was just Chelsea Wright from Sunderland. I mean, it's not like she was fancy or anything. I mean, she was nobody's nothing. I think that Morrissey understands the working class Brits who um, Tommy speaks for. Uh, let me play another clip for you from Morrissey. This is one of his latest songs, came out just a few months ago, where he takes on the lying media. He takes on the BBC, the Sun. Um, This is a funny title. It's called Spent the Day in Bed. Listen to what he says about the media. Take a look. I love that. I love that. Stop watching the news because the news contrives to frighten you, to make you feel small and alone, to make you feel that your mind isn't your own. Isn't that the truth, that your mind isn't your own? And to scold you for your thoughts. Thought police, word police. As we discussed the other day, there are on my evening show at 8 p.m. Eastern, there are now more than 900 officers with the Metropolitan Police. That's the name of the main police force in London, 900 plus police there do nothing but track down hate. That's a human emotion, by the way, 900. So when Morrissey says to make you feel that your mind isn't your own, I think he's talking about them. And he's talking about the Sun and the other newspapers who disparage anyone who talks about free speech, calling it a bizarre rant. And if you support Tommy, that's controversial, and he's just a racist. Very frustrating. Very frustrating. Uh, It's 12.14. We're doing um, a live chat. It's a super chat. Uh, Let me read a few comments, and then I'm going to shift gears. I have to tell you, that's made me enormously sad, which is uh, a side effect of listening to Morrissey. His songs are about betrayal and longing and broken hearts and frustration and pain. It's not a good thing for teenagers to wallow in. I don't think I'm glad I didn't discover them until I was in my 20s. Um, But when I think of what I have learned about the United Kingdom, I understand where that comes from. And I think Morrissey has his finger on the pulse of 
the UK more so than um, most politicians. You know what? I'm going to do this. I um, quoting from the Sun was uh, a good idea because I wanted to show you how how the mainstream media disparaged Tommy. But I'm actually going to pull up here on my own screen, and maybe my friends um, can get it. Um, on screen for you. I'm sorry, I'm just searching for this in real time. Let me read some other comments he made that The Sun ignored, okay? So I'm getting this from faroutmagazine.co.uk. Um, that was the magazine, not Tremor. Uh, maybe my friends can, can call that up. It's faroutmagazine.co.uk. And I'm sorry I'm, I'm throwing this at you here. Yeah, that's the one. Former Smith's frontman Morrissey has further elaborated on his political ideas and seemingly offered support to far-right activist and EDL founder Tommy Robinson. Again, far-right controversial. Uh, scroll down a little bit. It says, in a new interview with Fiona Dodwell on Tremor, Morrissey has further elaborated on his political stance and explained how he's supporting a party known as For Britain, which is being led by Anne-Marie Waters. Quote, I've been following a new party called For Britain, which is led by Anne-Marie Waters. It is the first time in my life that I will vote for a political party. Finally, I have hope. I find the Tory Labour, Tory Labour constant switching to be pointless. Isn't that, isn't that true? Let me read some more. I want to read some more because he talks about Margaret Thatcher in an interesting way. He says, Anne-Marie Waters seeks open discussion about all aspects of modern Britain, whereas other parties will not allow diverse opinion. Isn't that true? It's, it's obvious he's talking about the spicy issues, immigration, Islam. She's like a humane, this, I love this part. She is like a humane version of Thatcher, if such a concept could be. She is absolute leadership. She doesn't read from a script. She believes in British heritage, freedom of speech, and she wants everyone in the UK to live under the same law. I find this compelling now because it's very obvious that Labour or the Tories do not believe in free speech. I mean, look at the shocking treatment of Tommy Robinson. And let me just, let me read just one more line. I know the media don't want Anne-Marie Waters and they try to smear her, but they are wrong and they should give her a chance and they should stop accusing people who want open debate as being racist. As I, pre as I said previously, the left has become right wing and the right wing has become left. A complete switch and this is a very unhappy modern Britain. I would put it to you, he's a very smart and thoughtful man. Would you not? Would you not agree with me on that? And I'm sorry, I went, uh, I showed you the sun, and I'm glad I showed you the sun. Just the pure sneering derision. The sneering derision at Tommy Robinson, at Morrissey, and indirectly at their own readers of that tabloid. But I wanted to read you from a more primary source. I actually, I didn't go to Tremor, the, the original source of the you, you, but you'll notice what the sun excluded that Morrissey's frustrated with Tory Labour, Tory Labour, and he makes a good case for it. And that both the Tories and Labour do not believe in free speech. I think he's correct. And that he's certainly a fan of Anne-Marie Waters, and he says, well, at least she talks about things openly. Diverse opinions. Look how he uses the word diverse. Justin Trudeau, Theresa May, they use the word diverse. They mean, okay, do we have this ethnic group and that religious group? Morrissey means diverse opinions. Can we actually have a debate with two sides? I love Morrissey as much for his political thoughts. I don't agree with everything. He's a vegetarian. I, I'm not. Um, he's an independent thinker. He's what rock stars pretend to be, but so rarely are. Is there anything more corporate or more establishment than you 2 and Bono? I, I, even their tax schemes to avoid paying tax, I mean, offshore holdings, I mean, that's the least of it. I mean, there's nothing more establishment than a modern rock star. Morrissey is actually saying dangerous ideas, dangerous to his career, dangerous to the mainstream media. All right, I'll stop talking about Morrissey, but I wanted to tell you that that's a guy who thinks. And of course he's demonized. All right. It's 1219, and I get sad when I think of Tommy Robinson in the state of the UK and Morrissey. I should not talk about those three things together. Uh, let's get back to this side of the pond. Um, I guess we're still on the topic of media party. That's what I call 
the political media industrial complex to pretend that they don't have an agenda of their own, a narrative of their own, a party discipline of their own, I think is to delude yourself. I think the media party, some people call it the mainstream media, the lamestream media, the fake stream media. No, I think it's more like a political party. They have an ideology. They whip themselves with party discipline. They campaign more effectively than most political parties. They certainly have bigger budgets and bigger reach than political parties. Uh, the media party despises Donald Trump, of course, because he did not seek their permission to become president and, in fact, went around them, and they will never forgive him for that. The media party all loved Donald Trump before he ran for president. Uh, they loved his celebrity status. They loved his glamour. They loved his wealth. They loved his access to media and celebrities. They loved his TV shows, whether it was his beauty pageants or his apprentice or whatever. Uh, they only hated him when he left the political narrative. Out of the corner of my eye, I see a super chat come in. Let me read it. Lulu Bob says, I know George Soros is a billionaire, but how can he be allowed to control so much of the world politics? Well, um, I think one of the answers is he shows up. Uh, there are billionaires on the right, but they're too busy doing businessy things. George Soros has deployed an enormous amount of his fortune to politics. And I interviewed the other day a man named uh, David Goldman, who just returned from Hungary. And he uh, reminds us how much money George Soros has spent in Hungary compared to the size of that country. I'm going from memory here, but the proportion, like Hungary is smaller than America and then how much Soros has spent, it would be as if, and if I'm going from memory, correct me if I'm not precise on this, it would be as if Soros spent $60 billion in the United States in the last election, as opposed to the $2 billion Hillary spent. That's how dominant George Soros is in Hungary. Imagine trying to fight that. I mean, you, you throw a billion dollars around in North America or in the United Kingdom, you're going to have enormous political impact. But imagine spending that kind of money in a small country like Hungary. And George Soros collects small countries. He sponsors protests. He sponsors the migrant wave. He sponsors outright revolutions. So yeah, I think the answer to your question is he shows up and our team often doesn't. But back to the media party in North America, I want to show you just, uh, just how crazy Trump derangement syndrome can be. Uh, it's not just attached to Donald Trump himself, it's attached to Trump's wife, Melania Trump, who is so politically inoffensive, I have never heard a political word from her. Michelle Obama was always pontificating about this or that. Even her nonpartisan work was ideological in nature, trying to make kids eat her version of food. And she had this real war on kids' food or something. No chicken McNuggets, no pizza, no burgers. It was, uh, I don't know. Um, Melania Trump, have you ever heard a word from her about politics? Of course not. But she's despised, even though she's a supermodel, who is inoffensive and again was the toast of the town until Trump became president. She's despised now because she's seen as an accessory to Trump, or if not an accessory, uh, she's cast as some sort of victim. Uh, let me show you a clip from just last night on Stephen Colbert's show, uh, because Melania Trump had not um, bent the knee to the media party, has not come and chatted with them for a while, so they let their conspiracy theories, their truthers, their Melania truthers, here's Stephen Colbert. You know, we saw so much happen over the past week, but one thing we did not see was First Lady Melania Trump. <laughs> because as of the time we're taping this show right now, the First Lady has not been seen in public for 25 days. Well, I'm not surprised. It took that Shawshank guy years to tunnel out. <laughs> here is, here is. Here's the deal. Last month, uh, as we all know, the First Lady underwent what they called minor surgery. They say she's perfectly fine, and I certainly hope that's true. And they claim she came home to the White House. Trump even welcomed her back in a tweet in which he accidentally called her Melanie. <laughs> awkward. Not really awkward. I think that's more of an uh, autocorrect function. Um, but what is a little bit awkward is this bizarre obsession uh, about... Melania Trump, and why is she not bowing before the media party? Um, she had kidney surgery 
So uh, I haven't had kidney surgery, I hope I never do, but it would not surprise me if I had kidney surgery, if I wasn't really gonna trot out and um, engage with the jackals. That's actually not her job. Here's um, one of the leading jackals. This is from CNN, I think this was from June 3rd. Take a look. Speculation continues to build as to why we've seen so little of the First Lady. She skipped the going to Camp David trip with her husband and stepkids this weekend, meaning that the last time we caught a glimpse of her was on May 10th. That's 24 days ago, or more than three weeks ago. It was around that time that the First Lady checked into Walter Reed to undergo a procedure for what the White House called a benign kidney condition. We were told there were no complications, and doctors familiar with this operation, operation say it usually is done as an outpatient procedure. However, Mrs. Trump stayed in the hospital for nearly a week before returning back to the White House and hasn't been seen since. So they acknowledged she was in the hospital for a full week. Have you ever been in the hospital for something so serious that it takes a full week? But where is she? Oh, and the, the insane rumor mongering and rants. Uh, in fact, Melania Trump made a public statement about a week ago. Here's a tweet that she put out. I see, and, this, and look at this, she put this out a week ago, but that's not enough for the jackals. I see the media is working overtime speculating where I am and what I'm doing. Rest assured, I'm here at the White House with my family, feeling great and working hard on behalf of children and the American people. That actually doesn't read like Melania. That reads like a spokesman. Melania would never be so firm or combative. Um, I think that that was put out by someone who said, we've just got to deal with these insane people. Um, if only they gave as much coverage to another guy who's been missing for 10 days, named Tommy Robinson. Uh, a couple super chats have come in since I was uh, last reading them. Let me catch up on those. Um, sorry, I was distracted by the Morrissey thing. Let me catch up here. Super chats. Tom Youngjohn. Soros, the face of evil. I think so. Can we can we get the the clip of Soros from CNN? Where, sorry, from 60 Minutes, a couple decades back when Steve Croft asked George Soros about his role in rounding up Jews in the Holocaust. We played that a couple weeks ago. I'm going to show it again, because I think you're right. It's the face of evil and passivity and banality of evil in the face of evil. A Power of a Wish says, quick Ontario election prediction. How do you think it's going to turn out? Ford majority or minority, or will it be orange? Boy, it's tough to say. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with a conservative majority, a PC majority. That's my hunch. Um, Ostlash, OT slash, OT slash Satan. That's a, a, a nickname. Thanks again for supporting Tommy. Let's make Saturday demo in London. Huge F the P's. Um, you know what, I'll, I will talk to our team and see if we can film it, because you're right, I think we would, I mean, I showed you yesterday uh, the Support Tommy protest in Toronto, Canada, which was a fairly small protest, but I found it very, very well informed, and that's not usual for a protest. Uh, I hear in my ear that we have the clip from George Soros. Let's play that Soros clip. You know, it's easy for other people to criticize Soros. He's a wealthy and powerful man, and therefore has many critics, but I think the most damning thing I ever heard about George Soros came from his own mouth. And it was when he was asked by Steve Croft of 60 Minutes, you helped round up Jews for the Nazis. You were a kid at the time, a teenager. Have you ever lost a minute's sleep? It's a fair question. I mean, you're a teenager, your dad says, we're gonna round up fellow Jews for the Nazis so we stay alive. It's a pretty awful thing, situational ethics in a war. I don't know the right answer off, you know, easily. But I know the right answer 20 years later is not to say, it was thrilling, it was exciting, it was fine, I had no problem with it, didn't lose him in his sleep. Here, watch Soros say so in his own words. Hungarian Jew mm -hmm. who escaped the Holocaust mm -hmm. by posing as a, a Christian. Right. And you watched lots of people get shipped off to the death camps. Right. I was 14 years old. And I would say that that's when my character was made. In what way? that one should think ahead, one should understand 
and, and anticipate events, uh, and uh, one, one is threatened. It was a tremendous threat of evil. I mean, it was a, a very personal experience of evil. My understanding is, is that you went out with this protector of yours who swore that you were uh, his adopted godson. Yes, yes. Went out, in fact, and helped in the confiscation of property yes. from the Jews. That's right. Yes. I mean, that's, that sounds uh, like an experience that would send lots of people to the psychiatric couch for many, many years. Was it difficult? Uh, not, not, not at all. Not at all. It, uh, maybe as a child, you don't you don't see the connection, uh, uh, but it was it created no no problem at all. No feeling of guilt. No. For example, that uh, I'm Jewish, uh, and here I am watching these people go. I could just as easily be there. I should be there. None of that. Well, uh, of course, I, uh, I could be on the other side, or I could be the one from whom it, the thing is being taken away. Uh, um, but there was no sense that I shouldn't be there, because uh, that was... Uh, uh, well, actually, in a funny way, it's just like in markets, that if I weren't there, of course I wasn't doing it, but somebody else would, 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 would be taking it away anyhow. You know, was the, whether I was there or not, I was only a spectator, the property was being taken away. So I had no role in taking away that property. So I had no sense of guilt. That uh, was part of what Soros did back then. Um, I think it's probably accurate that he himself, as a teenager, did not seize Jewish property on behalf of the Nazis. But that's not all he did. He rode a bicycle giving summonses to the Jews to report to the trains to be sent to their death. So that, in fact, he took a very active role. Um, in one of his biographies, I, which, I forget which one, he said it was actually the most exciting time of his life. Imagine saying that, the most exciting time of your life. Do you see his cold-bloodedness, his... Uh, heartlessness, where he said, well, it's just a market. I mean, if I didn't do it, someone else would, because that's business for you. It's just a business deal. <laughs> that's George Soros. Um, I want to take a very short break, uh, because I want to totally shift gears, and I just want to change the tempo a little bit. I'm still upset, frankly, um, with how Morrissey, who spoke out so strongly for freedom and diversity, is being pilloried by a blue-collar tabloid. That is what makes me sick about it. Let's uh, have a palate cleanser, let's say. I want to play for you a short promotion for one of our shows here at The Rebel. It's called Off the Cuff Declassified. It's hosted by our friend John Cardillo. Take a look. Today on Off the Cuff Declassified, disgraced former FBI director Andrew McCabe wants immunity in exchange for Senate testimony. I'm going to tell you why I think he should not get it. Turns out Barack Obama misled America on Iran more than we ever thought. Today marks the 74th anniversary of D-Day, the Normandy invasion. I'm going to read you some incredible tweets from the 82nd Airborne Division as they reenact that morning. And the Virginia State Police had what I think is probably their most unusual car chase in maybe ever. That's John Cardillo. That's one of our many hosts here at The Rebel. We have uh, all sorts of YouTube videos, and we have shows behind our $8 a month paywall as well. Uh, it's something to consider if you like in-depth commentary of the sort you just can't find anywhere else. Um, I want to uh, shift gears to Canada now. I'm based in Canada, but really for the last 10 days we've been talking overwhelmingly about Tommy Robinson's case in the UK. But I do so not only because we have a connection to Tommy, he's a former employee of ours, but because we care about freedom of speech and we see what's happening in the United Kingdom as a sort of like a canary in the coal mine, a distant early warning signal, maybe not so distant, of what's coming to Canada and the United States. The United States has its First Amendment, which is quite a strong protection for free speech. The United Kingdom and Canada don't. I put it to you, that Tommy's troubles with the law are overwhelmingly rooted in free speech and the fact that he's challenging policies he doesn't like. And if the UK had something like the First Amendment, he would not be in jail right now and he would not have been harassed 
so much over the last 10 years as he has been harassed by his own government. I want to shift to um, a Canadian story, but first I'm going to take some more comments. Uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, you see streaming comments. I'm just going to read some random ones. If you want yours to stand out, feel free to chip in. Uh, you can spend two bucks, five bucks. I've even seen people put in 50 bucks as a super chat contribution that makes your chat bigger. It sticks it to the top and it makes it in bright colors. And the good news is we here at The Rebel get those revenues from YouTube, so it helps us keep the lights on. Um, I'm just going to read a few things. Andrea Hetherington says, free Tommy. Yeah, well, listen, there's, there's only two ways Tommy's going to get out of jail um, to be freed. One is when his sentence expires. Now, in the United Kingdom, they have a version of parole. They call it TAG. Uh, we use the word parole here in Canada. I think it's the same in the States. So y you don't generally serve every day of your sentence unless you're being very badly behaved. And I can't imagine Tommy would be badly behaved in prison. So in a 13-month sentence, he may get out in half the time, for example, or, or perhaps even less. Uh, the other way he could get out early is if there were an appeal of his conviction and if he was granted bail pending that appeal. Um, but I have to say, these rallies will not have a legal effect on him. I think they're important, these rallies. I support them, and we were delighted to cover the rally in Toronto. But you can't free someone from jail with a rally. There has to be something else, uh, a legal inquiry, uh, perhaps a government inquiry. But, but the protests, I think they're excellent. But what we really need, I think, is a legal appeal. Um, Mikey won 10,000. Tommy deserves a knighthood, not a jail term. Yeah, I think uh, prophets are reviled in their own time, aren't they? Jake Wright, I think the police are going to make Tommy do the 13 months because they want him off the streets. It's not the police who would uh, make that decision. It's others involved with the prisons itself. There's different uh, authorities. Um, I don't know if they, if, if they can do that. I don't know if they can make a prisoner serve the full term uh, if they are well behaved in prison i think that that will not happen um tommy nobison i'm taking you're not a fan says john malcolm he had a smoking gun in his hand no solicitor anywhere on the planet would advise him to plead not guilty well um i don't know if you're a lawyer but uh here's what i do know the lawyer tommy had in leeds was assigned to him moments before. Did not know Tommy, did not know his history, did not know the case he went through in Canterbury a year ago for contempt of court, did not know the, the intricacies of the law of contempt of court. So we don't know what a properly briefed uh, lawyer would have advised a properly informed client. We just don't know the answer to that. Um, there's a super chat from E. Moses Nefo. I don't see a comment attached to it, but if you have something, E. Moses, I'll keep an eye peeled and I'll read it. Um, Jeannie P. says, mega red pills indeed. Um, oh, here we go. Markella G., 200 Swedish kroner. Thank you. A photo appeared on the internet. We've got that photo. Can we call up that photo and show our viewers? Of Judge Jeffrey Marson laughing at the nearby window as Tommy Robinson has been arrested. Is it illegal for the judge to be witness of a crime and to pronounce sentencing on that crime. We'll call up that photo. We've shown it several times. I, I would give you a gentle correction and then I would answer your question. As you'll see in the photo, we don't know that the judge is laughing. I don't think the photo is that clear. And even if in that moment a judge looked like he was laughing or smiling, I don't think that we can make that extrapolation or conclusion. Um, we're we use that, we'll put that photo up as soon as we find it. Uh, but that is the curiosity of the obscure law of contempt of court, where the judge, him or herself, is the offended one, the complainant, the aggrieved one, and the judge, him or herself, then meets out a verdict. As we've discussed several times on this show, in most litigation you have a pro and a con, a prosecution and an accused defendant, a plaintiff and a defendant. In contempt of court, the same judge who was mad about something, who observed something he found contemptuous, then judges that very matter, including when he's still hot and bothered by it. I think that's a weakness in the law. In Canterbury, we were able to get Tommy out of jail for a week or two, so the judge had a chance to cool down a bit. 
Not so in Leeds, the judge, do we, have that, do we have that photo? It's coming up in one minute, we'll put it up when we have it. The judge went from, observe, there we go. I don't think you can say the judge is laughing. I don't think you can say that based on that photo, even if he looked like he was laughing. In fact, I think it would be the opposite. I don't think the judge would be laughing. I think he would be scowling because he certainly was, well, to use the word, thought that the judge himself was being treated with contempt. But that's my point. What were those two other people telling the judge? What were they whispering in his ear? We don't know. In a, in a regular trial, you, that would be disclosed. Those witnesses would be called. What did you say? Did you exaggerate what Tommy had done? Did you even lie? Did you make something up? Do you have an animosity towards Tommy? Were you out to get him? Who, said, who told you to do that? What's your feelings about Tommy? We don't even know who they are. Have you ever written or said anything against Tommy? Do you have a history with Tommy? Um, we don't know anything about that. In a normal court case, we would hear what those witnesses had to say. But here, those two people were saying things to the judge and vice versa, and we simply don't know what was said or done up there. We only know the results. Tommy was thrown into jail shortly thereafter. Let's read some more uh, questions on the Super Chat, and then I'm going to wrap up with a Canadian story. It's 12.40. Uh, let me just make sure I got the super chats. Emos is Nifo. Stop using their words. It is not grooming. It's rape by extortion. Coming to America soon. I've made that point before. Grooming sounds so well kempt. Oh, he's a, such a well groomed young man. Look at that neatly trimmed beard and that good haircut. And he brushed his teeth well. And he's, you know, wearing a clean shirt. Oh, he's such a well groomed. Yeah, grooming is absolutely a misleading term. And we've described in detail before what these girls are trapped and tricked and extorted and exploited and they're raped again and again, and they're overwhelmingly indigenous white British girls, and Sikh girls too. That's what Morrissey wants to talk about. That's what Anne-Marie Waters wants to talk about. I'm sorry, that doesn't make them bizarre or controversial. In fact, it's controversial not to talk about that. Uh, let's read some more comments. I have received comments on my video, and after checking, it seems Tommy Petition is being tampered with. I'm not sure who to tell. Well, there's many petitions out there, and I don't know which one you're referring to. Special case says the judge illegally tried Tommy because he was a witness. It was an illegal trial. Now I'm going to politely disagree with you. The nature of contempt, it's a very unusual animal. Uh, unlike uh, regular prosecutions where you have a crown prosecutor, as they call it in Canada and the States, or the you know, district attorney or the U.S. attorney or whatever, versus the people versus the accused. In contempt of court, it's, it's, it's a one-man... <laughs> you know, God on high on Mount Olympus throwing down f thunderbolts. That is actually the nature of contempt of court, which is why it's so unusual. So it was not illegal. Um, I'm going to read some more. Tommy Nobison, obviously not a fan, says, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. Well, I, I put it to you, no crime was committed whatsoever. Tommy Robinson committed no crime. He was standing outside the court, not on its own precincts. He was talking into a video, not causing a public disturbance. When he read the names of the accused, he did so from the state broadcast of the BBC. He did not say they were convicted or guilty or criminals even. He said they were alleged accused criminals. He did nothing wrong. And he did nothing wrong for 70 minutes. And the judge who tried the matter did so in a few minutes, did not obviously review the whole material. Uh, Justin Biebeler says, I'm Tommy. Well, I hope you are, because we need more like him. But the thing about Tommy, and it was something we dealt with when he worked for us here at The Rebel, is he, he always said his place was out on the streets, not in a studio. And this was a, a bit of a challenge, because a studio is safe. A studio, a studio can be edited. A studio is careful and planned. Out on the street, streets, things are random, and you're at the mercy of others, whether it's an Antifa thug coming up to punch you, or seven policemen arresting you on the street. Um, so... Tommy's nature put him at political risk, police risk, and the risk of being attacked. I have seen Tommy being attacked on the public streets several times. Uh, once he was put in a coma. I, I didn't see the actual attacks with my own eyes. I'm saying I saw the photographic or video evidence thereof. Um, let's read some more. Will Hay, it's the main petition for Tommy. All right, well, I, it's not our petition. John Zeeland, the alt-left will stop at nothing until they silence everyone that stands up for free speech with help from the media party. Yeah. Drinking man, Soros Nazis did the same thing in 1945 they were doing in 2018. It's the same enemy, German EU. 
based Amy, hi Ezra, I am the woman violently arrested from my home two days before Tommy's arrest. UK in big trouble, free Tommy. Oh, it's not interesting, were, uh, were you the video? That, uh, I don't think you were in the video we showed the other day, but if you were, that's interesting. Um, Kyle Vincent, I thought Lucifer is the light bringer. All right, well that's, Lucifer comes from the word for light, of course. Tammy Putin's Zanbelt says, Luciferians in today's world are called globalists. Well, there's different reasons to be a globalist. Mark Zuckerberg is a globalist because that's how he makes money. He wants to have a company so big that literally every human being is plugged into it. He already has two billion of the seven billion souls on the planet. He likes open borders because he likes cheap labor. He wants to be in, you get a cut of every act of commerce done in this entire world. Um, and there's also a messianic complex, a God complex. When you're that rich and that powerful, when you collect politicians like playthings when you're bigger than any elected official and more enduring than them. You start to think of yourself as a god and Soros himself has actually confessed to that god complex uh, which is easy to see. Uh, Josh says even Ronald Reagan said the new fascists will be called anti-fascists. That's right, he said they'll call themselves liberals. Uh, Justin Believer says pedo gangs, pedo, pedo gangs, that's right. I mean when you're praying, when you're targeting girls as young as 11, it's not just rape or exploitation, it is child rape. And, and that's, that's the most horrific thing I think we know of as people. Um, there's some crazy stuff in the comments too. Matt Getty says 30 million Christians systematically wiped from the earth by Jews. Where's the outrage? They don't even teach it in school, but we have a new Holocaust story every year. Don't talk about red pills. Uh, Matt, you're full of it. Uh, that's simply not true. Um, that's just crazy talk. Uh, it, it is accurate to say that, that Christians are being killed, but Christians in this world are being killed largely in two places, in Muslim majority places, and Christians are under duress in China. They're not as cruelly treated as the Falun Gong is, but they are under attack in Muslim countries that used to be Christian. People forget that Egypt used to be Christian. Turkey used to be Christian. Istanbul used to be called Constantinople. Um, I think this is a good opportunity to remind you that we did a documentary about the treatment of Christians in Iraq at the hands of ISIS. Uh, can, we, can we show, um, here's a little sizzle reel or trailer, if you like, of our documentary called SaveTheChristians.com. Back here, there are just all children of God, so we just do what we can to fix them. This is country needs us, and so I stay there. We assure them that we are with them to get, take care of them. So don't give me that BS about Jews killing Christians. That's just a damn lie. Um, Christians are under attack. You know, I was frustrated the other day. I saw the Pope was convening a meeting of global warming activists. How about convene a meeting of Christians under duress? Coptic Christians in Egypt, Syrian, Assyrian, Syriac, and Chaldean Christians in places like Iraq and Syria. I think that's what we need to focus on. Um, there's one more super chat I missed. Let me just find it here. Uh, dot slash Satan, uh, you got to change your nickname online. Says, do you think it's safe to go to the demo for kids? You're talking about the demonstration this weekend in London. Look, I've seen some pretty rough demos in the UK and it all depends on what the police want to do about it. I've seen police stand back and let the beatings happen if they feel politically motivated. I've also seen the police do an excellent job. I think it's a political question. 
I have to say, uh, I think it would be safe, but I think there's also a very real possibility that the police might say, you know what? This is in support of Tommy Robinson. Tommy's had some good press lately to free him. Tommy's looking sympathetic in the media. Tommy's coming across as a victim. Let's give him a bit of a PR black eye and let a fight get out of hand. One of the things I learned from Tommy in our year working together was how many times people tried to infiltrate him and his inner circle. Um, government informants, troublemakers, ideological opponents. And many of them were agents provocateurs, as in they would join to say and do outrageous things within the EDL to provoke a riot, to embarrass Tommy. And I believe that is absolutely the case in Antifa Soros type groups in the UK, that some of them are just stupid black bloc handkerchief masked rioters, but some of them are like they might dress as if they're a soccer hooligan and exaggerate and go far and, and do a Nazi salute or drink beer and do something really embarrassing because that's more effective to embarrass Tommy than just doing the anti shtick. They would do both. So in answer to your question very specifically, I would not take a child of tender years. I would take a teenager or a very uh, serious and grave tween. But I would also be on high alert if police were of the mood that things have been going too well PR-wise for Tommy and a good riot could stop that. Don't you agree? Don't you agree? I see some more Super Chats. Let's quickly read them. Primpal08 says, I wonder how many lesser known people have been put through the same sort of thing as Tommy has undergone. Huh. Well, I'm of two minds on that. On the one hand, I would think what's being done to Tommy is in some ways exceptional. I think that the targeting of him is obvious and it's disproportionate. So part of me thinks, well, they're treating him worse than anyone else. But the other part of me says, well, how would I know? How would we know when you're swept up off the streets and thrown into jail within hours and a press publication ban is put on top of it? How would we even know? And remember, the UK is the land of something so bizarre. It's called the super injunction, uh, an injunction banning publication on something and then a super injunction banning the publication about news about the ban. So a ban on reporting about a ban. That, I'm not making that up. Uh, only in the land of George Orwell would that be made up. Fraser McBurney says, since the UK have a freedom of information law, can you get the costs on tracking Tommy Robinson? How many cops does it take to watch Tommy Robinson? The answer is yes, the UK does have a freedom of information law, but like that law in every jurisdiction, there are exemptions. And I would imagine just off the top of my head that there would be exemptions that would reveal police operational details or even ongoing police operations. So I am quite sure that any request on that would be heavily redacted. That's just my sense. Um, let's check the time, it's 12.53. You know, I was gonna talk about uh, a NAFTA discussion between Canada and the United States. I just don't think we have time to get into that. I, I think what I'll do in the remaining seven minutes is I'll read some more chats and uh, do my best to answer them. Um, if uh, you have only joined us now, I would recommend that you go and read Morrissey's interview, not the extracts that were in The Sun or even in that secondary source I read, but go to Tremor, the original publication, and read Morrissey's comments. Um, to me, that was the highlight of the show today. A little glimmer of hope that there is still a true rock star who is a contrarian, who speaks truth to power, who isn't just about picking up awards and doing air kisses and being one of the lovies on the, on the BBC. Morrissey is that guy. Maybe it's because of his general anomy and his pessimism. Maybe that makes him more open to accepting the message Tommy has rather than uh, foolish folks who want to simply amuse themselves to death. Uh, let's uh, read some more comments. Someone with the name Simon Horowitz says, Jesus did not exist. First of all, I think that's a fake name. I think you're an agent provocateur trying to embarrass the Jews by having a Jewish name saying something so uh, 
antithetical to Christians. But that's a stupid thing to say because, of course, we know for a fact that Jesus exists. He was a historical figure. Um, and he was a Jew, by the way. And the Jews do not dispute that Jesus exists. There's a theological difference of opinion that's quite fundamental uh, between Jews who say that Jesus existed but was not the Messiah and Christians who say Jesus existed and he was the Messiah. But there is no person, either religious or atheist, either theological or archaeological, who disputes that Jesus existed. Why would you even say such a stupid thing? In fact, if you read the Quran, the Quran makes mention of Jesus. They call him Isa. And they change the story quite a bit as they do for Ibrahim, Abraham, Musa, Moses, and others. But uh, that's just a foolish comment there. Uh, Alan McCluskey, our government is very childish and will try and discredit Tommy. Yeah, uh, and I don't think it's childishness. I think it's the opposite. I think it's they're dead serious about it and they don't like um, the turn of events. Uh, they didn't think it would be such a noisy fight for Tommy. Uh, let me just see, Andrew Bursak, Israel is defending democracy in the Middle East. Well, Israel really is the only operative democracy in the Middle East. There are some elements of democracy in Lebanon. There's some elements of local democracy in places like Jordan. Uh, Iraq has a broken democracy. And I think that's just about it. Uh, so yeah, uh, not just democracy, but even more important than the democratic act of voting, the day-to-day -day civil liberties. You know, when I was in Israel, I toured the security barrier, the fence, the wall, whatever you want to call it. It's actually a wall in only one, one or two percent of its length. And there have been plenty of lawsuits by Palestinian groups to change the root of the law. And every single lawsuit, and I'm talking there's been like 20 of them, has been to have the Palestinians on the Israeli side of the fence, on the Jewish side of the fence, not on the side controlled by the Palestinian Authority. What does it say to you that every time a Palestinian sues about the fence, he wants to be with the Jews? Well, of course, because they have civil liberties, let alone the welfare state, and they're allowed to drink alcohol if they want, and they don't have to worry about honor killings and things like that. So yeah, I agree with you on that. It's 12.57, let's read some more. Um, Fraser McBurney takes 21 cops to watch one jihadi, so that would be 6,500 a week, at least to watch Tommy. Well, it does take about 20 cops to watch one person around the clock, and you've got 23,000 jihadis in the UK, so, you know, I can tell you right now there are not half a million cops watching the jihadis. It's just, it's a ticking time bomb there. Um, I remember Tommy did uh, some videos for us once when he was followed around all day in Luton by a police car. And Tommy went up to the cop and talked to him. Tommy was pretty polite, but he filmed it. Uh, Tommy implied that the cop was chasing him to sort of hound Tommy. Maybe. But I actually think the police could pick Tommy up any second they want to. I mean, they know where he lives. They, they probably track his car either through his cell phone or it wouldn't surprise me one bit if they put a, a, a GPS chip in his car. I mean, he's Tommy Robinson. Uh, they have various, I mean, he's a, of high interest to them. No, I believe that that day that the cop was following around Tommy, and I, I think I might have said this to him, I believe they were following around Tommy because they were worried he was going to be killed. In fact, near the end uh, of uh, Tommy's uh, freedom, um, I remember he told me he was in Europe, I think he was in Germany or Italy, and the cops came to his house and stayed overnight because there was a credible threat to his family. So it's a strange relationship with the cops and Tommy. Half the time they're there to throw him in jail. Half the time they're there to keep him out of the ground. And um, he's an inconvenient man for them. And for the same reason he's inconvenient for the Islamists, because he speaks truth to power, he talks about uncomfortable truths that too many people don't want to hear. And that the Sun, the tabloid Sun newspaper, that nothing is too gross or base or profane for them, well, Tommy is. They turn up their noses at Tommy. You wouldn't think the Sun is a snobby newspaper, would you? But when it comes to Tommy, they sure are. And I think that says a lot more about them than it says about Tommy. It's 12.59. I appreciate you joining us for today. We're going to wrap up in a moment. Uh, for those of you who 
want to see more of our produced shows every night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. I have a show called The Ezra Levant Show. We have other shows like John Cardillo's and Sheila Gunn-Reed and other shows. We have great YouTube content. Uh, we've been talking a lot about Tommy Robinson, and I think we're going to dial that down a little bit over the days ahead because there's just not news every single day on things. I thought the Morrissey news was interesting. Uh, I'll talk to our team to see what we can do about covering the rally in uh, the UK, this uh, in London this Saturday. I think that's important for us to do, and we do have a couple of folks on the ground there, so I think we should do that. Uh, that's it for today. It looks like it's uh, 1 o'clock, and on behalf of all of us here at Rebel World Headquarters, to you at home around the world, wherever you are, goodbye, and keep fighting for freedom. <laughs>